Well, hello everybody. I'm Garrett. You're watching Eleven Bang Bang. Today we are inside, and I just want to do a video on a subject that's being covered by a lot of people, uh, especially a American. Uh, he has a great prepping series of videos out there. He just did one on how to get home, you know, without rule of law situation. I have often thought about this situation. I live not like most people. I live out in the country, you know. Uh, long way from a lot of other people and without rule of law if that situation came down to us we would probably be seeing a lot more people because people would be coming out to find food out in the country getting out of the cities you know things like that but I look at this different perspective than a lot of other people because I'm not an expert in anything really firearms I'm not a tactician never served in the military my brother has he's actually deployed right now uh, he's been in there for a long time and he knows a lot of things never been in uh, law enforcement anything like that but I have grown up every day of my life around firearms and every hunting season one way or the other you know we're out there taking advantage of it and you know I live in nature a lot I'm outside a lot and uh, I have observed a few things by studying history. I got a pretty good collection of books back here. All these are historical books. Most of them have to do with the uh, firearms of the 19th century and <laughs> specifically a lot of it's about Colt manufacturing. That whole shelf up there is. But I also have a few books about the 18th century. Such things as Robert Rogers' Diary you know many other things like that the French and Indian War era very interesting era and when we talk about the situation that could arise such as without rule of law or whatever you want to call it the apocalypse you know basically the electricity goes off and there's no way to get any more and you know your generators are gonna run on gas for a little while I'm talking about not a week-long prospect but maybe a 30 year long prospect uh, you know, we turn into something like Venezuela or somewhere, you know, where people, uh, there's just no electricity, there's, it, the grid is off. And so, in that situation, what is going to be the most valuable firearm to have? Because that's what this video is about. It could be about a lot of other things, but we're just specifically narrowing in on firearms. Like I said, this is my opinion. I'm not a professional in any way, shape, or form. This is just the opinion of a country boy who spent his life reading history, studying history, and and firing firearms, you know, every day. And uh, let's face it, this thing we have, this modern civilized world, is not very old. Uh, you know, before the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, you know, anywhere before really 1840, the situation that we're talking about living in, that's what they were living in grant you there were a few differences people were already accustomed to it people had learned to live with it even in the cities uh, you know for millennia before that humans had just been getting along uh, on their own power and we've gotten away from that which is a good thing I mean it really is it's improved the lives of a lot of people but at the same time we are so disconnected from that time that many people will panic and you know things will be way worse than they would have been back then but the basic principles of living back in say 1750 still apply to 21st century world where the electricity shuts off now I know I'm wasted a lot of time getting up here but let's talk about the guns first of all if you don't have this first gun non grata the rest of this video won't apply to you I mean I think every household should have it and that is the modern semi-automatic sporting rifle and this goes without saying now I have flip up sights uh, peep sights you know if I ever get into a situation where I have to engage somebody at you know anywhere from 50 to 150 yards I have my pop-up peep sights right here they're set they're not gonna knock off this gun does not need a flashlight for the most part because when I'm in my truck it's in the daytime I go home at night I have other guns set up with lights I don't home defense gun should be set up with a light this is not the home defense gun this is the truck gun but it's basically just you know the truck gun it serves one purpose 
inside the vehicle, getting out of the vehicle, I have to engage an enemy from, or an animal or whatnot, from anywhere from 50 to 150 yards, this gun is set up to do it. And that's why I like it this way, it's sleek, and uh, you know, any type of gun like this, an AK-47, you know, any, any kind of modern sporting, or you know, people call them assault rifles, but they're just the modern semi-automatic sporting rifle, we have to have something like this for a situation that is without rule of law because your first and basic need is going to be to defend yourself from other people. Now, that being said, this is not the only gun you should have, nor is the AK or the SCAR or anything else that you might carry personally because this is a specialized weapon. It does work for hunting coyotes, it sort of works for hunting deer. It's too much power for hunting squirrels and rabbits, really. I mean, you can shoot them in the head, but you're still risking losing a lot of meat. And in this situation, meat and making a good shot is going to be very important. So yes, you have to have this for defense. It's good to carry with you everywhere you go in that situation, but you can't get along really just with this. Now, second of all, and I'm not gonna draw one up here, but you do need yourself a good handgun. Now you can get a Glock, uh, a lot of people think I hate Glocks, but I like the Ruger Security 9, I like the Glock, like 1911, 1911 would be a great handgun, uh, just practice changing those magazines, uh, anything like that, or come down here and get you an old school Smith & Wesson double action revolver, or here's you a Smith & Wesson uh, 357 Magnum, this one's an older one in 38 Special, or we can go in there if you have any refinement get you a Colt but the reason I say that is first of all you get the ease of reloading 38 special uh, uh, 357 uh, 45 you know anything like that and in that situation you are not going to want to lose your brass and a semi-auto the one downfall you're going to have with a semi-auto is you may find yourself in a situation where you can't you're shooting in the grass or something and it's flying away you can't find it, you're always going to want to be able to retain that brass. So that might be a good reason to have a double action revolver, anything, you know, snub nose, anything. Those are just the basic guns you have to have, okay? You need some kind of handgun, be it semi-auto or double action. I prefer the double action just for being able to save your brass. You're also going to need to have a good modern day sporting rifle. That being said, just like in the old days, the idea of you coming into conflict with a mass of people that are armed and trying to take your life it's much higher in a without rule of law situation but also people are people and there are such things as deterrence you know nobody wants to get shot especially when there's no doctors around people are going to be more apt to deal with you maybe try to be sneaky you know but at the same time everyone's goal is going to be to get away from everyone else and so you're going to see a lot of the resurgence of the small, you know, five acre farm, the little, the little, maybe 160 acres. People, if you don't have fuel, it's going to be very hard to work uh, a large piece of ground. So it's basically going to go back to what it was in the 1750s, which is everyone is just going to be working their own ground and providing for themselves. It will become an agriculture uh, civilization. All right. Now that I've been through that long rambly rant about the guns that you have to have, now let's talk about the guns that are going to be the ones you're going to use daily. In a situation where you have to go out every day and hunt for food, first of all, I'm going to count out the bolt action rifle, unless it's a 22. Just like in the old days, if you look back at Tennessee in the year 1750, you have buffalo and elk by the year of 1820. You don't even hardly have deer. You will see that the muzzle-loading rifles of the time went from a 58 caliber down to generally being made in 40 or smaller, you know, 36 caliber muzzleloader because all people were hunting in the era of Davy Crockett was a few black bears and squirrels and rabbits. That was all that was left in the southeast at the time. And that's what people lived on besides their home raised meat, you know, hogs and beef, and that's a subject for a whole different video, I know. But the fact of the matter is, if you're planning on going out there to your deer stand and getting four or five deer, you know, a season, I mean, it won't even be seasons, you're going to need 10 deer a year to survive you and your family, 
they're just going to get wiped out fast. Deer are not that hard to hunt. You know, they show up, they eat, they're big targets. You can sneak up on them. Eventually, when the people start coming from the cities to the country and figuring out you're going to see a lot of wounded deer running around with uh, 7.6239 bullets shot at them and uh, 2.23 or 5.56. Five, and don't get me wrong, some people can do really, really well with those rounds on deer, but it's not optimal. It's the lower end of a deer hunting round. But, like I said, all in all, the deer are going to move out to the bigger areas. You're going to see them getting up in Montana, Wyoming, places like that, and people will follow them there, just like uh, nomads would follow the, you know, natives would follow the herds of buffalo around the country. Uh, and people will follow that until they're gone, and that's just how that'll be. What won't be gone is the harder to get animals and the animals that repopulate quickly. Rabbits and squirrels and birds quail pheasants you know those things are pretty resilient and they're a little harder to hunt and they require more physical output to get them and you know they they don't provide as much meat they're going to hang around for a while just like in the old days and they are going to be the predominant game i believe for most of the country when it's all said and done so what about our ar-15 ak-47 sporting rifle it's too much uh, you hit one in the head, you know, you're going to take a lot of a lot of body off, and it's, it's too much power. Another thing to consider is how long will your brass last? A bottleneck cartridge you can reload 20 times, but you know what? Once again, a lot of it's flying off in the weeds out of a semi-auto, and what you can find, it has a limited shelf life because you can't reload it and reload it and reload it until it starts splitting. Now, you can get yourself a lever action, I have one right there maybe in 4440 45 Colt a straight wall case straight wall cases can be reloaded many 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 more times than say a bottleneck cartridge at the same time primers will became become an issue and finding primers is already difficult can you imagine what it's going to be like without rule of law it will be nigh impossible and you can make your own it's very time consuming so what does that bring us down to? Well, that brings us down to something like the Hawken right here. See, I have one right there. Uh, that is a Lyman Great Plains rifle. It is a percussion cap gun. You can make your own percussion caps easier than you can make primers. Uh, but it's still a very time consuming process and it's going to require special equipment and a lot of other things. So, I wouldn't suggest that. Now, there are a few other suggestions some people might have. Cap and ball pistol. This is another good thing for defense, but like I said, once again, we are down to we can make our own powder, we can cast our own lead. Caps are always going to be an issue. These things will run a lot longer than the cartridge guns because you can make your own caps, but still, at the same time, it's going to be harder to do. So, what do I suggest? After you have your sporting rifle, after you have your semi-auto or your double action or even your single action pistol for self-defense, uh, I suggest you look at a flintlock and look very seriously. I know you're going to think this sounds crazy, but you can make your own powder, cast your own balls, and in nearly, I would say, probably 80% of this country, you can walk out and find a rock that will work. If it's obsidian, if it's flint, you can learn how to nap that into a workable flint, and you could use something like this. Now... I don't just say this because it's something I thought of. This is historical. This action on this gun lasted over 300 years. The ignition system is so simple. Here, let me show you. We have a rock. We have a piece of steel. You have homemade powder. By the way, you can make your own powder very easily. Black powder. A lot of channels out there that have videos on just how to do it. You can heat up your own lead. Lead in car batteries. Lead in wheel weights doesn't matter does not have to be soft lead like a, a cap and ball pistol because you're not cutting a ring you're patching your round ball you put it in this this is a 36 caliber rifle very accurate find a rock it's got to be an obsidian or flint of some kind and cast your own round ball out of car batteries out of wheel weights out of old house pipes lead is everywhere around you if you look for it and then you're ready to go you need some patching usually uh, you know some kind of cloth but you can use grass weeds anything to patch that round ball in there you can make squirrel shots with this thing at 50 yards it's easily doable this is a Kibler Southern Mountain Rifle a lot of videos out there on YouTube of people 
shooting 50 yards, you know, shooting inch groups 50 yards with this thing, open sided, simple as they come, good for squirrel, good for rabbit, but still not the thing I would suggest above all others. If you want the most bang for your buck, the most economic option for a good hunting semi-defensive uh, weapon, go out there and get you a smoothbore flintlock. This is a Northwest trade gun. I want you to look at this. The end of that bore is very big, no rifling. This is a shotgun, basically. This is a 62 caliber or 20 gauge. Now, the beauty of this is not only do we still have the setup that I just talked about, and I will show you this gun is unloaded. I will show you this setup. See? The rock striking the flint, throwing spark in the pan, lighting your homemade powder, shooting your homemade 62 caliber round ball out of this. You can use this for years and years and years, guys. And, you know, it's you're never going to run out of ammo if you make your own stuff. But the beauty is you can take that 62 caliber round ball and shoot a moose and bring it down as effectively as anything in this country with this smoothbore flintlock musket. Well, it's not a musket, it's a trade gun. But anyway, you can shoot a moose. You can also load it with a bucking ball shot, which is one big 62 caliber round ball and a couple of 35 caliber round balls in there with it. And that makes effective deer hunting or anti-personnel rounds. It was used in the Revolutionary War that way. Now, the real beauty of this is you can cast what they call swan shot. You can use bird shot, but you could just take your lead that you're melting, drip it slowly into a bucket of water and make spherical pellets that look like a teardrop, actually teardrop shaped pellets. And you can put it in there and now in this one gun, you have an effective anti-personnel unit for one person. You also have an effective big game hunting gun out to about 100 yards. They're fairly accurate. And you can also have a gun that will take squirrels, rabbits, and birds with a little bit of practice. Now, one thing about these flintlocks, a lot of people are going to tell you they're unreliable, they're slow, they're hard to use. They're not. It's just like anything else you'll get used to it. It takes time to learn the system. Which way do you want to orient your flint on your particular lock? What kind of powder does your gun like? How much powder does your gun like? Working up a birdshot load for a cylinder bore, because these are cylinder bore, meaning there's no choke in them, so there you have to work up a load that works, which there's actually a load called the Sky Chief load on the internet that works really, really well at keeping that pattern pretty tight out to far distances. But this, guys, is the ultimate, in my opinion, survival weapon. You probably don't want to go up against two people with it because after you shoot it once, it's a club. But still, that's better than nothing. But at the same time, you're not going to be fighting as many people as you are on a day-to-day -day basis looking for food. And that game is going to be small game, rabbits, squirrels, anything you can bring home and make a stew or a soup out of that will keep you and your family alive. That's how they did it in the old days, and that's how you will have to do it today. Now, you say you've been from everything from ARs to smoothbore flintlocks. What's the next option? The next option is if you are going to have a smoothbore and you can get your hands on one, this would be your best option. This is a 62 caliber smoothbore side-by-side -side flintlock. And this just takes everything you can do with that and doubles it. Of course, you can load one side with birdshot, one side with ball. You know, that way if you're out hunting and you come across a squirrel, you're, you're ready to shoot. If you come across a moose in the next area that you're hunting, you're ready to shoot. You can load it up with anti-personnel rounds. Like I said, two barrels full of buck and ball is going to be a lot that a lot of people would not want to mess with. Like I said, you're going to have to learn the gun. You're going to have to learn the flint time the direction your flint needs to be in there. You're going to have to learn what powder, how much powder, what your shot needs to be. you got to go out and test these things. But overall, a double barrel smooth bore like this, flint lock, that you can make your own powder, you can make all the shot, all the bullets you need, and you can also go out and pick up your own flint and nap it into a usable flint, uh, something that's available all over the country. This is a very viable option. But even better yet 
is to take your double barrel smooth bore flintlock and pair it with a double barrel smooth bore flinter pistol. Now you're really talking. Now without any cases, any ammunition, anything that's hard to find, you can go every day armed with four shots of extreme, extreme firepower. This is basically just a short sawed off shotgun with a flint on it. At the same time that you don't need cartridges or anything like that, if you run out of lead, in these smooth boards, you can shoot gravel. <laughs> you can wad that gravel with a leaf. You can literally make these things run a hundred years without anybody helping you run or needing any other equipment than what you make yourself. Now, like I said, there are several channels out there on making your own black powder. I will suggest uh, Everything Black Powder is a channel that has uh, videos on it. Uh, I really like that channel, and he has some flintlock stuff too as well. But this is just my opinion. When it comes down to the worst of the worst, a years long drought that could possibly happen without electricity, without rule of law, in my opinion, these two guns right here are going to be the ones that you're gonna to go to every day. You'll keep the ARs and the semi-autos for when times are really needed, times are desperate. But for the most part, these two guns right here will, will see you through just like they saw people through all the way from about 1620 up to around 1900. And I know you're going to say there were lever actions and cartridges in the 1860s, and of course there were. Not everybody could afford them. Not everybody could afford caps. They hung on to these things for a lot longer than people give them credit for, and for the same reasons that I just said. Absolutely probably the cheapest gun in the world to fire if you make your own powder, nap your own flints, cast your own lead. You know, this does take prep. It does take practice. They're not like your everyday rifle. You're just going to go out and shoot a few times and get the hang of it. You're going to have to learn to deal with your flinch. I'm still learning after years to deal with that flinch. But for the most part, you know, after a year, if you shoot them a lot, you'll learn them. And you will learn how to use them effectively. That's all I have for this video. Like I said, this was inspired by AR American. If I might have said A American, he's now AR American but he has some videos out on prepping that are really good and so in my opinion and it's just my opinion the smoothbore flintlock is going to be one of the ultimate weapons if an end of the world scenario should occur I'm not saying it will but you know the things you need to have food supply that doesn't have to be frozen because your freezer is going to go off access to a well a windmill or an extreme amount of bottled water and you're mostly water. Water is going to be the most important thing. And a good flintlock musket along with the must-have AR and handgun of some kind. Anyway, that's all I got for this video, guys. Trust in God. Keep your powder dry.